Hi, this is Mary Pagano. I'm with Hera, and this is Hera TV. So we have an episode here we'd like to share with you. Maria Loris is going to speak to several poets who have written uh, the, the first anthology, Hera, the Light of Woman. So Maria, I'll turn it over to you. Hello, dear poetry friends. Welcome to Hera TV. My name, just like Mary Pagano had said, said now is Maria do Rosario Lourdes, and I coordinated the first poetry anthology, Era the Light of Women. The reason why I am here today, in order to present you three from, from more than 130 poets from all over the world who presented us with their magnificent poems. I'm going to start presenting you Dr. Rosalia Arteaga, former president of the Republic of Ecuador and great poet too. Then I will introduce you the German poet is living in Milan since long time ago, and Stan, who is also a woman of visual arts. Last but not least, the world famous and great master of the deconstruction, George Wallace. You will come a little bit later to you. Probably things you have to do. So I'm going to start asking you, Dr. Rosalia Tiaga, when did you start writing poetry? I will come and thank you very much. Thank you. Here. Yeah, this first I had to say. I'm so sorry. Uh, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here and to say hello also to Marianela Mirpuri, to Mari Pagano, to Angie Sten and to you, Maria Luris. Um, I'm happy to be here and to talk uh, through ERA TV. I think it's a great uh, and challenging uh, initiative and um, really, really happy to be part of ERA initiative that uh, manage uh, a dream. And uh, when you ask me about poetry, well, uh, I remember it was a, a really, really um, very little child that I started to love books first. My, my main um, issue at that time was uh, trying to learn how to read. And I remember my parents put me in a school and an initial grade. And uh, after a, a week, they told me, I don't remember that. They told me that I, I didn't want to go to school again. And they asked me, why you are not, you don't want to go? Because I said at that time, um, they don't teach me how to read and write. And uh, they are only teaching me how to play. And I know very well how to play because it's my voice. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, then, then I think it was the beginning because uh, I started to be and, and the, my, the, the nuns of, of the school because it was a Catholic uh, school. Uh, they put me in, a, uh, in another level. Then I learned very fast to read and and since that time, since I was probably five and a half or six years old, I started to be in love with books and uh, reading a lot and started to write short stories. Oh, beautiful. In poetry, I love to learn the poems of uh, distinguished uh, um, writers like Ruben Darío. I was fascinated with the modernism. And I also read a lot of poems written by um, uh, Ecuadorian writers, Latin American writers, and of course, after uh, uh, world writers. And I, uh, I think uh, I start to write poetry when I was in high school, uh, because I started uh, first with prose, uh, with uh, uh, short stories since um, seven, 10 years old, I was writing short stories, but with the poetry a little bit after. And I stopped it for a while because I didn't write for several years any poem until um, uh, it was like uh, maybe um, 15 years ago, I decided to take more seriously writing poetry because uh, I used it to write and I published some books in poetic prose or some stories or like that. But um, I feel very comfortable writing poems and I publish uh, some books and I'm also in anthologies in different, in different parts of the world. That's my initial experience. I'm happy you did that. 
<laughs> I'm happy. So now I'm going to ask Auntie Stan also a mega question. Uh, Auntie, you are the creator of the art piece Rucksack Global Poetry Patchwork. Could you tell us a little bit about it? Microphone. Yes. Microphone. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for inviting me and thank you very much for this great initiatives and this big work that you did putting together all these poets. And thank you to Hera founders that I see the first time here. So I'm really pleased to be here. Um, my uh, project, Rucksack, a global poetry patchwork, was born during the lockdown, during the strong lockdown we had here in uh, Italy. And somehow I'm a visual artist, so I work with material that I elaborate with seeds or with things um, I recycle and do some installations with these. And so I started collecting the tea bags. No, you know, when we were all close, we had strange behavior. So I put away all these tea bags and I said, what can I do with it? And I wanted to do a big rucksack, but I couldn't drink so much tea. So I asked my poet friends if they would help me collecting tea bags and send me also a poem about the tea subject. subject. <laughs> In my mind, there was uh, there's some interruption, I don't know why. Um, in my mind, there was the idea to make um, an installation together with poetry, as I did already before. The point was, uh, somebody said, ah, oh, let's make a call on in the internet. And within very few weeks, I had about uh, 250 participants. And people from all over the world send me, me their poems. And uh, so now this is a real, let's say it's a trip around the world, this rucksack, which is also the symbol of free traveling, of course. And right in the beginning, I met this Indian poet, uh, Mamta Saga, and she got enthusiastic. And so she presented 25 Indian poets in 25 different languages. So this was really, I mean, this was uh, fascinating. Then I had the possibility to exhibit this rucksack in the little museum of poetry, which is in Piacenza in Italy, which is a very special place because it's the only museum, it seems, in the world dedicated just to poetry. And so I did this big installation of the rucksack made of 250 and even more tea bags. And around this rucksack, there were these poems from people really from Iceland, from Peru, from Africa, from Japan, really all over. And even the tea bags, it was wonderful, especially in the situation of lockdown, no? that you saw a tea bag from Tibet, maybe next to one of Japan, next to one of Iceland. So we were all together in this big rucksack. And uh, this project still goes on because uh, the people um, made videos, registrations of their poems. So I have a channel where I public every yeah. week these poems yeah. because yeah. I have not finished yet. I have published those 110. So I know the work you did, I'm still going on with my work. But I think it's these are important initiatives, very important. Yeah. Thank you very much, Antje. And now, till before I ask Dr. Rosalia this second question, I have to thank you, Mrs. Marinella Mirpuri, my big, great friend from school times, for giving us this possibility, like you too, to present your Rucksack Global Poetry on ERA TV and all the things all over the world. Uh, Marinella, I, I have to thank you again for the Fund, Fund Foundation and for your organization, for all your thank power, you, Maria. Thank engagement. You. 
I'll, by offering me, you know, I really, <laughs> yeah, I have to thank you again. Thank you. I, I also have to thank you. And uh, uh, just to say a, a few words, my name is Marianella Mipuri. I am the founder of, the, of Terra. And Maria is a friend for, uh, for many years indeed. We were studying together in school. Uh, we were young, uh, young girls uh, uh, having their dreams and uh, some of our dreams came through. And I have to say that you never have to give up your dreams. So I had the dream some years ago when I started to think about doing a whole city in honor of humanity and especially for women. Uh, some people thought this is an impossible dream. It's not going to be possible to, to make the, this because, uh, uh, and many people uh, did realize uh, and did not realize until today that this is not utopia, that this is a project that is going to come to light and it's going to make the change in the world. And we work for a better world. We work for a better future for humanity based on the respect for women. And that's why we are building this very special place, a smart green city that uh, is actually the place where the change can be made. The anthology is a tool of communication, like we have other tools of communication in this project. We have the Hera perfume. We have uh, many events going on all over the world, being prepared to communicate the, the, the message of Hera. And uh, I, I knew Maria uh, do Rosario, and I knew her skills and uh, her professionalism as a poet and, and also as a person that he was able to, to, to do the best anthology that uh, uh, at the times were difficult because we were in COVID and I, I, I never thought she could get 100 and uh, almost 40 or more than 140 poets. And uh, that's why we are preparing another anthology because there are many poets in the waiting list to, to, to come and uh, write for Hera. So Maria, congratulations. I have to thank, thank you that. for all your effort. This was not easy to prepare this anthology in COVID times, uh, but uh, you did a nice work. And I hope this is the first of many other uh, interviews uh, uh, that Mary, uh, Mary is the, the Hera TV manager uh, and she's preparing a lot of, uh, of programs like this to, to pass the, world of, the word of Hera. So Maria, I'm sure you are going to have another chance to speak again and invite other poets from, uh, from the anthology. So thank you very much and good evening to everyone. I have to thank you too very, very much, Marinella. Go ahead. So, Dr. Rosalia, now the second simple question. Have you ever published poetry books? You, you told already anthologies, but your own book, second book? Yes, I'm very, yes. I'm curious. <laughs> I want yes. to read you too. <laughs> well. People say that my prose sometimes is like uh, poems. Uh, I wrote uh, one of my books was very well known, translated into several languages. The name of the book is Geronimo. I had a very hard situation in my life because I had a Down syndrome kid and he unfortunately died when he was less than a year, 10 months age. And he, when he passed away, I was pregnant of my third kid. Imagine that it was a tragedy in my family and especially for me. And they, at that time I decided to, to write like a kind of catharsis to, to take away all the, the pain, the, the tremendous situ situation that I was living. Then uh, this book had been translated into English, to Portuguese, to uh, Italian, to Chinese. Uh, this is prose, uh, poetic prose. But uh, after that, I, I wrote uh, some other books. One of the books, uh, the name is um, uh, Rosa, Rosa Carmin in Spanish, like wow. Rose and Carmin. Uh, <laughs> it is like an uh, ironic uh, 
uh, name to describe the situation of Guman. And I take very historical Guman in my country first. Um, and I take sin since the prehistoric historical times because uh, before the Spanish people arrived to Ecuador and uh, I, I composed a poem for each woman. And um, the poems are historic because I take the history and put into poetry. And uh, I take also other women from different countries of uh, South America or Latin America in general. Okay. The name of the book is Rosa Carmine and was published by a Colombian uh, editorial. Uh, I also have another book. Uh, they are single books, not with other person. Uh, the name is Conjuros like uh, talking about the magic of the of the words uh, and i took words and I, it's like a play i was playing with the words <laughs> and i take a word for example an, uh, 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 a word that probably is very familiar for you in portuguese uh, <laughs> I, I learned portugal in, in my portuguese in in brazil and the name of the poem is saudade so uh, because saudade is uh, Something so, most yeah. and more than nostalgic, and also capoeira and candomblé, the, the yeah. words that I was familiar, very familiar when I lived in Brazil. Uh, well, and I, um, those are the two books of poetry that I That's had published, and I'm in a lot of anthologies, and I am, I have a material for other books. I didn't have to, the time to publish, but, but maybe in the, in the close uh, future. I'm very, very curious. I'm really so. Thank you, thank you very Next much. Next time in Portugal, I will, I will bring I, some. I'm books. really, I, I'm very curious. I, I have to. I was, I was recently really, with Marianne. I'm a, I'm a really, there. Yes, I'm next a time. Really, really, very, very curious. So, second question to Antje. One of the aims of the anthology and the light of women is to promote gender equality. How is your experience of gender in the art poetry world? And here. Yeah. This is a sad subject, I think, because somehow here in Italy, especially, let's say the official public uh, places where poetry is represented, is often in the hands of old poets. And women are there, but they're always in the second row. And so and this experience of the lockdown for me was a very positive experience because I got organized by myself. I was in the internet and I got organized uh, with whom I wanted to be organized. And I, I feel a very big freedom in this because um, it's a completely different uh, place. In the town of Milan, I'm working in a group that is called Poetry is My Passion. We are three women, one from Cuba, one from uh, an Afro-American uh, woman, and me from Germany. And we work with uh, foreign communities in Milan. So we organize our readings and we do lots of social work uh, involving poets from all over the world that live in Milan and give them a voice in their mother tongue and value their situation as an artist. So I think this is very important, but we have to organize ourselves. The public institutions, sometimes they're even in the hands of women, but they give mainly the money, the support to the old poets. So this is a little bit sad, but it is in our societies because the discrimination of women is systematic, even in the Western world. So you just have to go out in the street in Milan, out of hundred, if you see the street names, hundreds out of hundred, 95, uh, men, male name, and maybe five are women names. And out of these five, two are from the Madonna. So um, you can see, you know, I mean, one doesn't notice, but one has to notice because these are little things and our societies are full of this. So I think this is still a long way to go. 
me personally as an artist, I succeeded doing always what I wanted, but that doesn't mean that there's, there's equality. No, some people uh, have success, although there's a male dominant society, but uh, most, for example, in art, at the academy, there were more women studying art than men, and the ones that still do art are the men. So that's the reality. That's the reality. So, and now I'm going to Dr. Rosalia Atiaga again. I, she, she gave already a, two words concerning this question. What things are inspired you, poetry, your poetry? Well, uh, it's a, a very interesting question. Uh, many, many uh, inspiring uh, possibilities. Uh, well, uh, something that happens surrounding me, but uh, mostly when I, I feel like uh, with, a, with a, a really hard situation, like it, it happens with Her Geronimo, and um, also in circumstances uh, when I feel um, like uh, deeply in love. <laughs> yeah, love is a, a, a big source of inspiration. And um, well, sometimes I, I decided uh, when, I, when I have a, a task, like someone asked me, like Hira, for example, uh, they asked me, um, well, you want to, to write a poem about Hira? And I say, yes, of course. And I, I take the inspiration from Hira. And uh, in other issues, uh, for example, when I talk about uh, the women's uh, poems, uh, of course, I get inspiration from all these fan fantastic women in, in my continent and in my country. And um, uh, sometimes, uh, uh, because I am a, a very prolific writer of articles, I write a lot of articles also for, for newspapers every week I write. Then it depends if I write about politics and uh, of if I write about uh, uh, something uh, in my country that I can see or when I travel uh, a lot, uh, uh, I, I get uh, several sources of inspiration. And nowadays, because I'm a grandma, I get a lot of inspiration of my grandkids. I have uh, seven grandkids. And uh, this is the reason probably that I am writing a lot of, um, of uh, stories for, for kids. And um, I remember like a couple of years ago, one of my grandkids, the older, with 10 years, she says to me, I need a poem uh, to talk about the, um, uh, the development goals, the sustainable development goals. And she, she, she asked me, can you make a poem about that? I say, oh my God, I never imagined that I, I could write about the sustainable development goals for, from United Nations. Finally, I did it. And it was fantastic when she presented uh, to the high school because it's, it was like a ceremony in a theater. And she says, my granny, write this poem for me. <laughs> well, it, it demonstrates to you that it could be a lot of a source of inspiration. That's wonderful. So. And I will come again with a with question to you, but now I'm going to ask Antje again. Yes. Your poem in the anthology has the title Tendering Be My Little Quarantine, which refers to a dating site, which is very popular in Germany, but also worldwide. Do you think meeting on the net is the future of relationships? <laughs> yes. <laughs> now this tindering, I don't know if you know it. I didn't know it before, but I got to know it because some friends who are single during the lockdown, they started using it a lot because um, if you're lonely and you look for somebody for a relationship, this is the way, the only way it, it could be. And uh, but this is very popular, even in German. Do you have the word? Ich gehe tindern, I go tindering, no? So I go on this app and I just have a look, who looks nice, who could be okay for me, no? So it's a little bit very consumistic way of looking for a partner. Maybe I first read you the poem and then I have a little more uh, chat about it. Is it okay? If you please. Yes. 
Tindering, be my little quarantine. The child god, born from a tight, offers its flesh in every shop window to the dispassionate passerbys with the desire stuck inside cell phone screens. Scroll, scroll, scroll. Fingers light, windshield wipers clean the surface over and over, trying to touch a skin, smell a scent. Words, swipe, swipe, swipe. Here he is, Prince Charming, seductive, smiling, swipe. A creative, smart, swipe, open, reliable, honest, communicative, swipe, dead eyes, scroll. The armor around the heart, like the snow chains in tires, makes you keep on traveling, even with a hole in the tank. So this um, way of putting yourself in relation through an app, for me, I think it's very limited because <laughs> many things are missing. In fact, the words, the scent, whatever is missing. So, but I must say a friend of mine, he used uh, this kind of app where you can't see the photo. So it's a little bit more communicative. And uh, he, met, he wrote to a woman and the story came out and the woman just lived five minutes from his house. So this was a wonderful meeting and I hope he will be happy for a long time. Happy but yeah, but even relationships online like we have now, no, these internet relationships, for me, this is a very uh, good thing. This can give a future uh, relation because we go across borders. We can speak from Portugal to uh, Ecuador, we speak together. And so we can really develop new ideas. So using the internet relations like we do in this art projects, I think this is the future because uh, traveling, although the borders are all closed, but also for climate reasons, we can't take the airplane and go and see each other. It's, uh, I think this is a good idea, a good alternative. Mm. Pros and contras, every single life in our life. Yeah. Rosalia, Dr. Rosalia, uh, the, I have a question, but the open question, I know also how I, what I have, I'm going to ask you because I watched a video from you some days ago I published it on Facebook and I want to know <laughs> like things went on, run, uh, went away. Okay, but now what feelings about era do you want to share to our poetry friends in the, all over the world? Well, um, well, uh... Uh, about poetry or in general? About it, era, uh, organization. Era, 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 of course. Of I think uh, of, uh, the feelings are more related about empowering women. Because uh, during uh, the history, uh, women, um, we had been uh, many times considered like people of uh, second or third category. And uh, the idea is that we cannot do any public things, more only in private. Then um, I strongly believe that um, we, the women, we have all the power, all the knowledge, all the experience to do things and to change the world. Um, this idea of change the world for good, uh, it is something that ERA has uh, been trying to put on the table of discussion and also to create the idea of uh, uh, the cities of ERA, where we will have the possibility to empower women and to make the woman feel that they can do everything. I, I think uh, most of us can have a testimony of life. Like in my case, I had been the first uh, minister of education, culture of sports of my country, and also the first uh, female uh, vice president of, and president of the Republic. 
I um, many times I had to work only with men because they were not other women uh, surrounding in, in terms of uh, in the army, for example. Uh, now we have even generals going out. But in the past, uh, I, I had been in politics more than 20 years ago. And it was very, very seldom that women can be in, in, in different positions. Uh, I remember I had been um, in, in uh, studying and also now I, I see that uh, even now, in nowadays in, in Western hemisphere, we don't have enough uh, number of women leading the countries, for example. Mm. Uh, and when you see the list of Nobel laureates recently we had in, uh, in physics, in chemistry, in biology, they are most of them only men. In literature and peace, uh, more women, but not in the other fields. Then in the, in the academy or in the academic field, uh, we still have some kind of discrimination for women. And we are talking about Western hemisphere but not when we talk about other parts of the world, when women are fighting only to go to school. Imagine that, that is tremendous. Then I feel that we can do a lot from here, uh, not only like a dream, like, uh, but also like a, re a realistic idea to make the world a better world. Then those are the feelings that I want to share with you. And I'm going to make you the Question number five now. Can you tell me, you know about it very well, are your picture on the, the same, the place where all the presidents yeah. have the picture now? Are yes, picture after, after tell more us than about 20 this. years. Yeah, tell us about this. Well, it was a story. If because, you can, if you can. If you can. Yes, yes, of course, of course. Uh, I get uh, uh, the presidency and I suffer a coup d'etat. Uh, after that, uh, they uh, they have a, a gallery of portraits in the in the palace of the presidency, and they avoid to put my portrait there. They were only men, and after uh, um, like twenty years, almost twenty years, a group of women from Ecuador asked the president, why is not the portrait of the first women, uh, the first uh, women president of our country? Finally, they fight for that. I didn't, they do that. And they uh, get the, uh, the portrait there in the palace. Uh, I received the, no the news about that uh, in a very, very occasional situation because one of uh, one friend from Argentina was here and he sent me a picture from the yellow yellow salon they call that uh, the That's portrait the salon the yellow one uh, and he sent me a, a picture and say only a picture and I was it was my portrait I didn't know that they put they put the portrait there and I said oh my god they put it uh, but they, they didn't tell me anything <laughs> and uh, when uh, I realized that I I sent to my sister and some friends and say, well, look at that, they put the portrait. And um, well, uh, one of them put on Facebook and it was like a, a, a big uh, uh, news in all the media and people wanted to talk. To <laughs> it was fantastic. And I feel really a lot of support, especially from women. And I was very happy for that, really. Thank you for I making the question. I'm happy to <laughs> thank you very much, Dr. Rosalia Tegel. I wish you all the best and thank you for the power and for the example you are for all of us. We can do it. We have the power, but people, women have to, to believe uh, ourselves like you did. I suppose you had the support of your family too. Yes, yes, I had the support of my family. I think uh, I, I, I was very lucky because my parents, especially my father was really very open and I was the first uh, kid I have after a, a brother and then two sisters and my father and my mother never make any difference between us. And I believe uh, since I was a very, very small kid, 
that I had a possibility to study, to do things. I'm not from the capital. Now I live in the capital. At that time, I used to live in, um, in a, another city in the south part of Ecuador. And it was not easy because sometimes when I was trying, even studying law and doing things like that, uh, some people were uh, a lot surprised that I, I want to do things. Now, these days, I am running for another big challenge. I want to be the general secretary of the um, uh, um, Ibero-American community. Then I am asking the vote of the 22 countries to be the head of the Ibero-American uh, community. And it's another big challenge, but I am used to being big challenges. And I, I would love to have the support of the countries to do more for women and do for more for uh, people, especially people in rural areas in, in, in situation of risk and with uh, poverty and disadvantages. Um, that's my dream. And of course, I am supporting IRA to do all the, the big ideas and to realize all the, the good news that uh, we are supposed to do and to have all these uh, uh, working women all over the world. It is great. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much to, for your effort and your example for us, all, all of us women. Thank you very much. So Mr. George Wallace, master of the, the constructionist, will come, you are with us now. So Mr. George Wallace, I have, can you say some, some words now, two words about you? Good evening to you all in Europe. I'm here in New York City, ready to uh, enjoy a few moments with all of you. So, you are known as a native New Yorker and writer with strong roots in New York City. But I understand you have lived and worked in a number of regions in the United States, which regions have helped shape your poetic vision and choice of subject matter. Yes. yes, around the United States, I have been very fortunate for 20 years. I lived and worked in California, Texas, North Carolina, Massachusetts, different parts of the countries, Hawaii as well. So I got a chance to, to learn about the different um, regions, which may not be as different as Nuremberg is to Lisbon, but still, you know, there's quite a few differences, quite a few basic differences. So within, inside the continental 48 states of America, you know, I had a chance to, uh, <clears throat> to expand my vocabulary, my cultural vocabulary and my consciousness of what I am and how that, um, how what I am is not only a product of location, but a product of aspiration. By aspiring to be, to understand the people in the South and North Carolina, for example, it expanded my human consciousness. So this is uh, something I learned by living and working many places around America, around the United States. You also lived and worked extensively outside the United States too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Can you tell something where and also the influences? Uh, well, <laughs> it was a cross-cultural experience, much more cross-cultural experience, which to me, um, you know, uh, I, I took as an equal partner um, in the places that I lived. I lived in Korea for two years, South Korea. I lived in England, in the UK, for five years. And of course, I traveled many places, all the way from Vienna to Istanbul on the Orient Express, and the land route brought to India from Istanbul all the way to see the Dalai Lama in uh, Northern India. 
So in all of these cases, I treated that experience as, um, as a sharing experience. There was something for me to learn from other cultures and something for me to share of myself and my own culture. It's very tricky being uh, an American because in America, you know, being in America in one sense is, is, is being a representative of global culture. Yeah. Pop culture, pop American culture, hamburgers and Elvis Presley. But only in one sense is it the global culture. It's also an indigenous culture like Austrians or Nepalese or people in, uh, in Australia or any other place. So, um, so uh, in order to, uh, to share in a positive way, in a non-intimidating way, it was important for me to learn to be non-imperialistic, to avoid any, any suggestion that, that I was representing the dominant world culture and you can be like me, be like the world culture. This is something as an American, I was hyper conscious about. So, George, I'm going to make Auntie Stan last uh, last question. Uh, Auntie, you are not a, just a poet, but also a visual artist. Uh -huh. What is the difference? in using these different kind of expressions, Antje? Yeah, somehow um, it's like speaking two languages. So in every language we have words that the other language doesn't have. So expressing myself with uh, sculptures has a possibility. And often I, afterwards, when I do a sculpture, afterwards I write a poem about it because uh, working as a visual artist, it's somehow you create something and you don't know what it is. So to understand it, you look at it and you have lots of thoughts and then I write them down. And in the end, I have my poem, which somehow puts together the real thoughts that are in this art piece. That's uh, somehow um, happened with a very big uh, feather dress I made that is uh, exhibited, uh, it's a piece of the museum, of the poetry museum in Piacenza. It's in the center. It's like a big, big uh, dress. I don't know of what, but somehow uh, then I wrote a poem about it and I understood what it was. <laughs> so you can express yourself in any way, with music, with a poem, with art, with drawings, whatever, uh, with prosa. These are all ways of expressions that um, everyone has one specific thing that the other doesn't have, but in the end, it's somehow, it's creativity. And creativity <laughs> is a wonderful thing that you, we have in life. Do you mean if we don't find the words, you can make it create it with with the visual arts? You know, it's somehow if, for example, I write in German my poems and in Italian, and I write different ones in German because in the German language I can express things that in the Italian language. Italian wouldn't understand somehow. So even the translation is difficult. So every, we are so rich. Everybody has thousands of things inside. So if you have different languages and different ways of expression, it's even better because you can do more. I think creativity is putting together, putting together everything what there is. <laughs> so I'm going to make the last question and then I go to Josh and stay with Jaws till the end. So what do you think about the anthology Arid Light of Women? Yes. Yeah, I want to compliment myself with your work. I already said this big, big work of uh, editing this thing. That's very, very hard work. 
but also of putting together uh, poets really from all over the world, uh, like there's Abba Justina from Nigeria, there's, um, I don't know how to pronounce, Abdul Kaladha Kozimov from Tajikistan. There are really poets, new poets for me that I didn't know before. So um, somehow you also did a kind of networking because one has a list of lots of poets that maybe can be interesting with for events that I organize. So I think this is very important, not that we uh, publish our poems in different uh, places. And so everybody gets to know everybody. I am, of course, the public that, that is not into poetry. It's difficult, but they get to read this anthology, I don't know. Mainly it's a poets themselves that are interested in other poets, no? And what I liked also very much in this uh, anthology is that lots of rucksack uh, poets are present there, no? George Wallace and uh, Claudia Piccino, Aziz Montasir from Morocco. So um, there is already a big, big exchange of, um, and networking going on. And I think this is the important thing. So compliments to all of you, the Hera founders, and to you, Maria, for your big, big work. Thank, thank you. you very much, thank you. Thank you very much. So go, going to George now. George, your contribution to Ellie's evidence of your commitment to women's cause are there other examples of your commitment in action? Do you have an, other commitments in action? How does your commitment to women's issues fit into your overall view of social action as an artist and as a human being? Certainly, yes. I, I think that um, there are some issues that, um, that one can approach from an uh, ethical standpoint and from a, um, an empathic standpoint. They do not have to be your own issues. My gender doesn't matter for me to be concerned about certain issues. My race doesn't matter. My nationality doesn't matter. The important thing is to uh, to be driven by the greater human questions of justice and empowerment and actualization of every human being. So to me, the most important thing is to become selfless, to, uh, to take on and to work and to speak out about something because of the pure universal human justice issues, not because it's my personal issue. So I feel liberated to be able to speak to women's issues because I'm liberated from my own needs and concerns and you know, appetites and all these different things. So I can approach the question in the purest of terms as a human being. I think that what you've done by allowing to, uh, men to be part of the conversation in Hera, in this book, is critically important and really commendable. You could have made it something, oh, this is only for women. We have women speaking to women's issues. It would have been okay. It would have been good. But this is better because it elevates the issue to a universal issue. That's something that Simone de Beauvoir already said when she was alive. So, but now I'm going to the another question. You always seem to have many projects in works. <laughs> what are you correctly, current, currently working on? that you can share with us, that you can uh, share with us? Well, I'm on a diet. 
I'm on a <laughs> diet. I'm trying to lose weight. <laughs> That's one thing. My car is being fixed right now. I was driving to work yesterday and the car boom, exploded oh. on me in the highway. Oh. And so I'm trying to get my car fixed. Why? Because on Sunday, I have a friend from a poet friend from Santa Monica, California, <clears throat> coming into New York City. And I have a very nice little convertible, Mazda Miata. So I want to put him in the car, put the top down, drive to Coney Island, and buy him a hot dog. I want to eat oh. hot dogs with him, oh. Coney Island. So I have to get my car back for that. Those are very immediate concerns. Of course, yeah, I have many, many projects in poetry. The biggest one right now is an anthology of New York City poets, which is supposed to come out in uh, spring 2022. 179 poets, 255 pages, inclusive of many different uh, voices and, and concerns. And um, it's going to be released then. So I'm trying to figure out how to get uh, uh, get uh, some attention to this book before it comes out. So this is a big, exciting project for me. I'm the editor, the curator of this project. So, and now my last question. Okay. Did you knew personally, personally, R Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the woman you wrote, oh, yes. Yes. the homage, the big homage you wrote in our, published in our anthology. Yeah. Did you, yeah. Can you tell us two words, more phrases about her? <laughs> um, <clears throat> um, a woman I admire and I'm so, <clears throat> I thank you so much for what she did. Uh, I would say, Oh I, would say, um, I would say this, pound for pound, you know, by weight or you know, kilo, kilo per kilo, she is probably the strongest woman of the past, the strongest human being of the past 20, 30 years, pound for pound. Okay, maybe you know, there were people, other people who were equal to very great challenges, but she was only this, this tall and she was... She only weighed 96 pounds, <laughs> which is like a big sack of potatoes. So it weighed about the same as a sack of potatoes. But she took on the entire patriarchal judicial system of, uh, of America and defeated it and overcame it and won the affection and love in that process. She didn't, she didn't go against the system. She, 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 she overwhelmed the system and made it her own. So just a tremendous, a tremendous human being. You know, I think Mother Teresa, maybe, she was about the, you know, Mother Teresa pound for pound was pretty impressive as well. So, uh, but uh, that's what I admire most about Ruth Bader. And of course, she is from Brooklyn. <laughs> now, this is very big for me because being from Brooklyn, she's, she's like a rooster. She fights like a rooster, very, and I admire that. And she loved opera too. Yeah, she did. Turandot and uh, and Tosca. She liked the uh, women heroines. And so, in my poem, this is an interesting question, Maria. I like this question because, you know, um, she liked the There's a particular uh, opera. It's Princess Ling Ling, you know, from from ancient China, and she is being attacked by, you know, by, by men in, in ancient China for, for dominance and ruling. And she, she stands up against the men in the court in ancient, um, in ancient uh, China. This is a Turandot. And so it's a beautiful parallel and metaphor for what she was able to do. So, yeah. Finished? Yes. I have to thank you very, very much, George. I have to thank you very, very much, Auntie, and I have to thank you very, very much, Rosalia. I enjoy, I love to be with you here, and I thank all the people who are listening to us. 
Thank and you very much. Thank you. Fabulous Mariana to see you. Mary Pagano. Thank you. And Mariana, thank nice you. to meet you finally. Very pleased to meet you, Mariana. Nice, nice you. to meet you too, uh, George. I hope we, we have the chance to meet personally one of these days. Thank you very much for your contribution in the first hair anthology of poetry. And uh, thank you, Aunt, Aunt, Auntie. <laughs> I don't know how to, Auntie. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I already did thank Maria. Thank you, Mary, for carrying on the, these sessions that uh, I think it's very important to show uh, what we are doing in terms of communication in the project Hera. And uh, I promise you, we are going to build this city and we are going to make the change in the world. God help us. Thank you very much to everyone. Thank you, Marina, too. Bye bye. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today at Hera TV. Really appreciate it. Um, your work has been amazing and we're very grateful for it. So, Thanks again, and we'll see you on the next session. Take care. Thank you, Mary Pagan. Without you, I